Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Deadhead Cannabis Show. I'm Larry Mishkin of Mishkin Law in Chicago, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Jim Marty in Colorado. Jim, how are you doing today? Very good today. Things are good. Um, uh, hot day here, 96 degrees. Uh, I'm in Denver. A lot of fun stuff going on. You know, we're still full capacity concerts. That's excellent. Heading up to Red Rocks Friday afternoon for Tedeschi Trucks for another sold out show oh my goodness i saw in fact i saw you at red rocks at tedeschi trucks two years ago right right yeah hard to believe it's already two years but uh, that's a great show to go see you know how much i love them well we have a we have a, a, a fun show today uh rob hunt is uh with his family on vacation and hopefully having a very nice time uh so it's going to be just like the good old days and jim and i are going to drive this train today. We've got a little bit of marijuana news to talk about. Uh, we have some fun Grateful Dead stuff to talk about, uh, not the least of which is that uh, uh, yesterday was Jerry Garcia's 79th birthday, and we couldn't be the Deadhead Cannabis Show if we don't take a few minutes to mention and reflect on that. But uh, let's start off on the marijuana side. And Jim, uh, it seems like pretty much ever since this podcast began, uh, my news and updates from Illinois were always very dreary. No licenses being issued, no uh, information as to when that might happen or what might take place. And lo and behold, just a week or two ago, uh, the state came out and surprised everybody by announcing a whole number of licenses for craft grow, for processing, and for transportation. And if all holds according to form, tomorrow is supposed to be the first of the planned three lotteries uh, to start handing out the licenses for dispensaries, uh, which were supposed to have been handed out in April a year ago. So uh, to say that people are very excited and uh, uh, you know, happy to finally be finding out would be an understatement. Um, it's very, very exciting times here. And the hope is, is that uh, with these new licenses being awarded, it will really allow the Illinois program to kind of you know, take off and, uh, and, and, and just really grow to uh, the size we all know it can be. Yeah, when do you think they'll actually uh, be open and have sales? Well, it's a good question. You know, the, it's interesting because under state law, they uh, the, the people who are awarded the licenses um, are supposed to be up and operating within six months. You're given one six-month extension for good cause shown. Um, but pretty much they want to get these folks up and operating as soon as possible. I, I imagine the dispensary folks won't take too long. The real question will be how long will it take for the craft grow uh, to really get those first set of uh, uh, plants out the door. So hopefully, um, you know, we'll be able to move quickly. And I would like to think that by the beginning of the new year, if not soon thereafter, uh, Illinois adult use purchasers will have a much wider variety uh, and options available to them. Well, that's great. Yeah, you know, to build out a, a retail uh, cannabis store, you know, you can do that in a matter of, you know, 60, 90 days. Um, but, yeah, cultivation... You know, I'm working on projects with my clients that it's a, a full year to first harvest. And that's if everything goes right. Yep, so, yeah. that's a good point. And six months might be optimistic for some of these guys. So, oh, God, But, yeah. you know, the, the good news is at least that up to this point, the medical uh, cultivators have done a fairly good job of uh, keeping us supplied. Not, not a perfect job, which is why we'll welcome these new cultivators coming in. But certainly, I think, till they get up and running, and of course, the medical cultivators will love the fact that there's going to be uh, that much more shelf space for them to display all of their products on. So we're, we're very optimistic and uh, looking forward to the expansion of this program. Well, that's great. But yes, when it comes to cultivation, you have a whole host of different levels of government that can cause delays. So, you know, you get your license or approved finally from the state. Now you're dealing with local zoning. You're dealing with the building department. You're dealing with building codes. Uh, then you have the fire department who's going to come in and make sure you have a proper sprinkler system before you can go anywhere. So yeah, there's all kinds of uh, delays on the cultivation side. Yep. And you know, look, I guess it's to be expected. And like anything else, the good news is the licenses have been issued. So we'll be looking to see if... Uh, you know, how quickly these guys can really get up and moving. But uh, it, it, it's wonderful to have adult use in Illinois. It'll be even more wonderful when the program expands like that and, and, our, and our options and, and choices just uh, grow exponentially as we're, we are all hoping they will. What's, uh, what's the latest out in Colorado? Oh, sales are, are good. Uh, several of my clients talk about uh, not quite as good as last year. Others are saying things are better than last year. I think overall, we'll, you know, we'll do our two 
$1.2 billion in sales this year, of legitimate sales. So um, a lot of people think because of, or some of my clients are saying because of COVID last year, they really had good sales with all that uh, unemployment money and people staying home. Um, but uh, yeah, it's up and down. Um, prices uh, wholesale for a pound, fourteen fifty to sixteen hundred for very good cannabis. Well, I have to tell you, I'm I'm very interested to see what's going to happen to the overall legal cannabis market because following these wildfires that are happening out in Northern California and Oregon. I was just reading a story the other day about how, uh, you know, the, the, the Napa Valley wine growers are, are, have to be concerned about this, but of course, so do the marijuana growers. And a lot of those guys up in that part of the world are the black market that supply a large amount of the marijuana that gets sold around the country outside of dispensaries. And if their crops are affected negatively by that, um, that could be a real boon for the legal market if the black market supply dwindles. Yes, yeah, that could be a, a concern. Of course, a lot of that's, you know, fairly low quality outdoor, I would say. Yeah. Well, either way, you know, it's something that we have to be looking at. And certainly if you're uh, legal or illegal out in that part of the world and you're trying to do outdoor growing, well, I guess even indoor growing is potentially affected the, as fast as some of those fires move around. That's really something to see. But uh, hopefully everybody will come out of that okay and that the, uh, the marijuana market will not uh, suffer any negative repercussions as a result. Yes, we got very hazy skies both here in Colorado and then I was up in uh, my parent company, Minnesota, last week. Uh, they're very close to Canada and very hazy skies up there from the forest fires in, in Canada. Yeah, that's what I've been hearing. Um, they've even told us that here in Chicago there's supposedly some days where some of the... Uh, overcast can be attributed to that it's uh it's kind of a scary thing and uh hopefully everybody out in in those areas and, and, and i was just hearing that apparently there's there's wildfires in massachusetts now as well so uh, i guess it doesn't matter where you are you know everybody's susceptible to it to some degree and uh, hopefully everybody can stay safe safe and uh, uh use their cannabis to keep them calm the other big news jim that i see out there right now and i know we've all kind of talked about this a little bit and hinted around at it but one of the uh, interesting side effects of the 2018 Farm Bill, which legalized hemp and CBD, is that it set the 0 0.3 standard for THC. So this recognizes that hemp plants do, in fact, have Delta-9 THC in them. And uh, what a number of processors were doing uh, is they started taking the CBD and converting it into Delta-9 THC in the legal marijuana market. Uh, the state of Washington has now come out and told the marijuana processors uh, that they are not allowed to do that. They cannot convert hemp-derived CBD into Delta-9 THC in the legal cannabis market. Um, that's a move that certainly the uh, marijuana cultivators are going to be very happy about because I know they've expressed concern in Illinois and in other states that the legal hemp market gets an unfair advantage because a certain percentage of that THC is considered legal. And if, if you gather up all of that legal THC, all of a sudden you're doing pretty good for yourself and you don't necessarily have to go purchase at a uh, dispensary. Yes, it's a very blurry line. You know, even real marijuana is, is shipped across the country from states like Oregon, and they just say it's hemp until it gets to its ultimate destination, but it is for the illicit market since there's no inter interstate trafficking, of course. Every, all the states are silos. But, um, yeah, I have an extractor up in Fort Collins, and they do a great job, and I've been getting samples of Delta-8 and Delta-9, and uh, Delta-8 gummies are just wonderful for sleeping. If I take one before I go to bed, I just go into a a deep, deep eight, nine hour sleep. Yeah, no, Delta 8 has been a real discovery and that's been an issue too, I know, talking with uh, uh, clients in the marijuana industry who are concerned about the prevalence of Delta 8 THC and, and what impact that could potentially have on their business. And, you know, it's interesting because as we talk about it, in Illinois, uh, the, the marijuana guys uh, tried to push through a bill, uh, a new hemp bill that would really restrict what uh, the hemp people could do and, and, and put into place some pretty severe penalties. And I reached out to the marijuana people uh, on behalf of some of the hemp people. And, and, you know, my position on this, Jim, is that rather than the marijuana people complaining about the quote unquote, you know, advantages or benefits that hemp has because it's legal, uh, you know, and therefore trying to pull the, 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 uh, 
the restrictions on hemp down to the marijuana level. Let's do it the other way. Let's bootstrap the marijuana people up to the hemp level and demonstrate, you know, how well this can all work together. Uh, in other words, hemp and marijuana don't have to be on opposite sides of the coin. They can become partners and I think uh, improve the market for everybody. Yes, well, and it's all one big family in the end. So uh, there's people who like uh, low THC. I know that, you know, people who like the pleasure of just smoking, uh, just they buy their $80 uh, bags of uh, an ounce of, uh, of shake. Right. You know, and, and for, I, I'm a big, big fan of Harlequin, right, which is very, very low THC and, and, and very high CBD. And, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, there's always going to be room in this market for the marijuana people and the hemp people and that, uh, you know, everybody will be a lot better off as soon as they figure out how to work in harmony with one another as opposed to, you know, thinking that somehow they're at odds with one another. Agreed. Uh, musically, um, as I said, I'm looking forward to Tedeschi Trucks this weekend, Friday night, actually. Tedeschi Trucks is going to be huge, but talk for us a minute, Jim. Tell me a little bit about what's going on with your son's band. You were you were emailing us about this, and I want to get that story out because that sounds really exciting. Yes, he's in uh, two bands. Uh, one's called Kings of Prussia. Jack's a very talented keyboard player. In fact, he's one of the leading keyboard players here in Denver, and he gets asked to do gigs almost you know five, six nights a week. Uh, but That's wonderful. Yeah, so they're in a fish tribute band called Kings of Prussia, very popular here in, in Denver. But he's also in another band called Squerve that does all original music. And Jack's written a couple of songs, and they have a CD, and they also have a um, um, video that just came out too. So we'll have him on maybe next week, and we can talk about it. Well, maybe we can get uh, the video and you know post it onto our web page. We can ask our crack producer Dan Humiston and heck what you know if we can uh, get some CDs out there in the world and expand his exposure let's do it yeah it's actually getting some uh, airplay here in the Denver market wonderful well, that's got to be exciting as a father to see your kids succeeding as a musician it is it's kind of fun going to see and you know, my wife and I go and see their gigs you know we usually just uh, stay until set breaks as we're not late night people as much as we used to be <laughs> and let him hang out with his friends but uh, yeah, we all, actually that band Swerve, uh, all the members of the band and myself went to see Goose a few weeks ago that I was talking about. And it's really fun to go to a concert with musicians because they're, oh, he's playing this keyboard and he's, they have this guitar. And, sure. Yeah. Well, I got to tell you about Goose, Jim, because you were on the forefront of that wave. Um, last weekend, I had the very distinct pleasure of getting to spend one night out of three with my son and his friends at his bachelor party. My son's getting married over Labor Day weekend. They had rented a house up on a lake in Wisconsin, and I was invited up for the night, and these guys were all... The best part about it for me was it could have been my friends. Same music, same everything. Uh, everybody was having a good time, definitely marijuana and, and all the other good stuff going on. Um, and these guys are all, you know, as tuned into the music scene today as they could possibly be. And I heard one of them starting to talk about Goose for a moment. And I went over there and said, hey, I just heard about this band. You know, tell me about it. And oh, my God, they couldn't stop talking. They said, these are the guys to go see. Uh, they are the new thing on the jam band circuit. So hats off to you for being on that train early on. And did they put on some Goose music for you to listen to? Got to listen to a little Goose music, worked it in between. It was great. You know, half the group wants to listen to Fish, half the group wants to listen to The Dead. So, you know, a lot of good alternating going on back and forth. But, yep, good music. Well, as we mentioned, I think last week for our fans out there uh, listening, uh, check out, if you can find it, the uh, Goose uh, doing a cover of uh, Peter Gabriel's In Your Eyes. Okay. Okay. We'll make a point of that. But on the music side today, Jim, we, of course, being the Deadhead Cannabis Show, would be terribly remiss if we forgot to point out to all of our listeners that yesterday, August 1st, was the 79th birthday of Jerry Garcia. And um, hard to believe that he's been gone for 25-plus years now. Um, hard to believe, you know, relatively speaking, how young he was when he died. And... Um, you know, it, it, it's moments like these when we get to his birthday. I think, you know, that all of us deadheads of a certain age who, uh, you know, really cast our lot with Jerry and, you know, dived into that headlong, you know, due to a, a love and appreciation of everything he did. Uh, we just have to take a few minutes and, and stop and think about that. And uh, it's a good thing, I think, to, you know, to have those thoughts. Sometimes they can be a little bit sad. But uh, at the end of the day, he had a profound impact on so many people's lives 
that it just it, 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 it has to be remembered and it has to be mentioned every chance we get. Yep, uh, only 53 when he passed away, so he'd be well up into his 80s if he was still with us. Um, surprising to see, you know, Phil Lesh in his 80s now with a pretty rigorous tour schedule. I'm looking forward to seeing hopefully two of the three shows here in Colorado in September. Um, and uh, there's a couple of really good books out there on Owls, uh, Stanley Owsley, uh, Bear. Uh, and that's one of the books is called Bear. And then the other one is Owsley and Me by Roni. I'm trying to think of her last name. Oh, Stanley. Um, and she um, has incredible stories. So it's funny. Uh, you read the first book about Bear and he uh, and his relationship with Jerry Garcia and what he did for the Grateful Dead and how he batched millions and millions of doses of LSD uh, from, from the man's point of view. And then you read Roni Stanley's book, and it's much more from the feminine side of things. Uh, she remembers what people were wearing the first time she had sex with them and things like that that, of course, only a woman would remember. <laughs> so, uh, But, yeah, two very yes. great books on Bear and a lot of good insight into the early days of the Grateful Dead a lot of quotes from Bob Weir, uh, and a lot of good pictures of uh, Jerry and Owsley in, in the early days, and the Wall of Sound. Yes, and, and that's that's a great thing to to follow up on. And you know, the more books we can get, and the more we can read about it, and and all of that is just a wonderful thing. But yeah, it really I think you know ages us all just a little bit. You're right. Phil Lesh is in his 80s, and he's playing concerts like nobody's business. And um, you know, we all sit here and look at these guys, you know, as if they're still in their prime. And somehow when they get up on stage, they still play like they're in their prime. Uh, you know, the best example I saw was a few years ago when we went and saw Warren Haynes' group coming around doing their recreation of The Last Waltz, and they brought out Garth Hudson uh, towards the end uh, to play keyboards on Chest Fever and a couple of other tunes, and the guy could barely walk. Uh, and they sat him down at the keyboard, and all of a sudden he woke up and his fingers were flying across the keyboard like he was 35 years old. And uh, the Neville brothers played well into their late ages, and and all of these guys do. They just they, they maybe have another physical infirmities or problems, but you put their instrument in their hand, and it just wakes them right up. And it, it's just that innate talent that never goes away. Yep. Yeah. Bear was 75 when uh, he died in a car wreck in Australia. Right. I remember reading about that. Yep. Yeah. He was firmly believed that. Uh, as opposed to global warming, there was going to be a terrible storms and ice age in the northern hemisphere, and that's why he moved to Australia and homesteaded down there. That's so funny. Uh, slid off the road on a rainy, muddy uh, road because he was way out. He lived way out in the wilderness. So, mm. but uh, yeah, it's quite amazing stories about a very, very independent, uh, brilliant, and world-changing man. Yep, it's true. It's true. So. Uh, a, a, a one day belated uh, happy birthday shout out to Jerry Garcia um, we're always thinking of you and of course to his family our thoughts are with you as well because uh, we all know how important Jerry was to everybody and uh, the more we can uh, pass that along and, and again that that was the fun part about you know for me at the bachelor party the, obviously these kids are all too young to have ever seen uh, the Grateful Dead but to be able to talk about it and share the stories and um, you know, what it was like when he was up there playing and, uh, you know, all of that is just, uh, you know, really, really special and, and really a lot of fun. And uh, I'm, I'm very thankful that I, you know, was around at the right time and got to be a part of it. Yes, my coffee cup says I may be old, but I got to see Jerry Garcia on stage. That's what it's all about. Now, speaking of the Grateful Dead and Jerry Garcia, on the first week of August 1971, the Grateful Dead played a few shows. One of them uh, was in San Diego. Another was at the uh, Hollywood Palladium. <clears throat> and then a couple of weeks later, they played a show at the uh, Auditorium Theater in Chicago. These are all great shows. And in a minute, we're going to be listening to a musical clip from the Hollywood Palladium show because it, it's such an outstanding show. But there's a special significance behind all of these shows. And given that this is the 50th anniversary of these uh, San Diego and Palladium and Chicago shows, it seemed like a really good time to talk about this story because it's one that I don't think a lot of deadheads really know or really appreciate. In 1971, or, or going into 72, when the Grateful Dead uh, realized that they were going to have to be making a change at keyboard, and some point along the way, uh, they met Keith, and they determined that he was going to join them. Uh, but before they went out on the first tour with Keith, Jerry gave Keith a box 
of what was tapes for most of the band's 1971 summer tour. And the purpose of giving Keith the tapes was so he could go home and listen to them and learn how the band played and be ready to go on tour with them. Keith's wife, Donna Gauchow, uh, says that it's really kind of ironic because Keith never listened to the tapes. He just put them in a box and he wound up storing them on his parents' houseboat. They had a houseboat, he was on the houseboat, and that's where he decided he was going to keep the tapes for the time being. But he never listened to them, he never had any use for them, and they just sat there. And eventually, he, of course, and Don went on and joined the band and played with them all through the 1970s and until uh, the middle of 1979 um, when uh, he was out and, and Brent Midland joined. But through all this time, those tapes sat there and they were forgotten until probably just about maybe 10 years ago. Uh, and Donna's story is that her husband and her son were cleaning off the houseboat and while they were cleaning it, they uncovered a box filled with reel-to-reel -reel tapes. And they had no idea what they were. They weren't labeled. All they knew was it said Grateful Dead 1971. So obviously being connected to the family, uh, they got the tapes over to Dick Lavatla and the Grateful Dead crew who sat down and started going through all of them and realized that this was the missing 1971 summer tour that nobody had been able to find. And nobody had known what had ever happened to the tapes until this whole story came out. So all of a sudden, the dead were sitting on some Betty boards uh, from the early 1970s uh, that nobody had. Uh, in fact, according to Dennis McNally, up to that point, the band hadn't even been able to find audience tapes of those shows. So this was a huge, huge, huge discovery. And uh, Dick Lavatla, being the genius that he is, uh, had the very difficult job of having to listen to all of this music and figure out what was the best. Uh, and he took that time for all of us and put together Dick's Picks 35, which has the full show from San Diego on August 7th, a uh, good chunk of the show um, from the Chicago Auditorium Theater, and uh, about seven or eight tunes from the Hollywood Palladium on August 6th. It's a... Uh, it's a point in time for the Grateful Dead that we've been talking about quite a bit, 1971, the uh, Capitol Theater shows at, at, in Port Chester, New York, um, and uh, uh, a number of other shows that they did that year uh, that were just really, really good. They were on a great roll. They were transitioning out of the uh, psychedelic stage into the more traditional rock band stage, and these shows are very reflective of that transition uh, uh, taking place. So... Uh, first of all, I would highly recommend to anybody that they get their hands on Dick's Picks 35 and just listen to the whole thing. But then what's even better is to go online and, and really read this story and just realize that, you know, this is what happens in the Grateful Dead world all the time, right? It's like when you're talking to your buddy outside, you say, yeah, we'll meet up after the show, and you walk in and they're in the seat next to you in a 20,000-seat arena. Um, you know, just as easily that houseboat could have been sold to somebody, the box could have never been opened and just thrown away. Uh, you would think that sitting on a houseboat, the ravages of time and the weather and all the dampness and moisture would have affected them, but yet somehow the tapes pr uh, were preserved and they were discovered, and now we all get the benefit of that and, uh, and we get to listen to it. Yes, well, I can fill in some background on some of those uh, stories uh, from my point of view. Please. So, uh, yeah, and of course, it was Bear who started recording the band, mainly so that they could listen to themselves in the hotel rooms after the shows. And right. And Bear called it his diary, and he was meticulous about recording every show in, in uh, great high quality. Um, in 1971, he was serving two of his three-year prison sentence for manufacturing LSD, and that's when Betty Cantor took over, and that's why we call him Betty Boards. Yep. Then on, yep. Good point. the Keith and Donna story is, yes, uh, Donna went to the film, uh, the Keystone one night when Jerry Garcia Band was playing, walked up to Jerry when he was having a, a cup of coffee at the table and said, hey, you should be uh, having my husband in your band, and uh, he really should be in the band. So that's how... <clears throat> that got started. So those are my little fill-ins on, on the stories you're telling. Well, that, those, are, those are great fill-ins, and you're right that, you know, we all, everybody, you know, loves and loves to talk about the Betty Boards, uh, you know, but had Owlsley managed to stay out of jail, who knows whether uh, Betty Cantor would have ever had that opportunity to step in. So, um, you know, once again, uh, the machinations of the dead world always seem to turn strangely, but somehow wind up... Uh, really being for the best. So I've got a clip for us, Jim, from the uh, 
August 6th show at the Hollywood Palladium. And quite frankly, as I was listening to it, there was probably four or five different things in there that I could have selected. And ultimately, it came down to uh, the introduction to the other one. Uh, and, and I would tell anybody, uh, if you buy this disc, uh, go to the August 6th show, or you can find it on archives.org and listen to uh, the, the introduction to the other one in the second set coming out of drums. It's just absolutely spectacular. However, in a nod to uh, Mr. Garcia and his birthday, uh, I've selected a clip out of Deal, uh, which is probably one of Jerry's signature tunes. And um, it just uh, we're going to have Dan play it for us, and we're going to really have a chance to hear just how hot those guys were and how lucky we are to have this music uh, preserved. Dan? <laughs> Jim, I got to tell you, that's about as good as it gets. You know, Deal, I always think of as, as, you know, if you have to name one tune that just, you know, Jerry completely identifies with, Deal is it. And my love and my, my difficult love affair with Deal is I love to hear it, but when you hear it, you always knew it was the end of the first set. And so you were like, well, that's okay. But by the time he got into the middle of that jam, you know, you didn't care where it was coming from. It was just, uh, you know, on a night when Jerry's on fire, Deal is as good as it gets. Yes, yeah, since we had Sandy Troy on a few weeks ago, and he raved about the late 60s, early 70s period. I've been listening to quite a bit of that, and very, very good. Uh, Bear had his own opinions about that, that he thought Jerry was best in those years, and he thought by the late 70s and early 80s, the, the drugs had diminished his uh, playing ability a little bit. Um, so, yeah, a lot of people think those early 70s shows are, are Jerry, who's in his late 20s and at his peak. And it really sounds like it, you know. It, it's a band that at that point knew they, you know, that they were they had it made right. They were they, they had survived and uh, and they were really discovering their footing and the type of music they wanted to play. And, and I think in all of these seventy one shows that we've been listening to and focusing on, you know, you you feel that confidence and you feel that energy and you know the strength with which Jerry's playing those 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 chords. And of course, the beauty of it is this is you know nineteen seventy one. This is fifty years old. And, you know, those notes and those chords are as familiar to us today as they were back then. And uh, it, it's such a distinctive sound that he created. Um, and no disrespect at all meant to John Mayer, who's done a fine job with Dead & Company. Uh, but I think that it's a sound that's just impossible to completely um, be able to copy. There, there was just a, such a uniqueness about it and his ability uh, to do it the way that he did it. And... Uh, you know, it, it, people ask me sometimes, don't you ever get tired listening to all this Grateful Dead music? And my response is, there's not enough time to listen to all the Grateful Dead music I want to listen to. Yes, I agree. So though, that's all I have for today, Larry. Well, good, Jim. You know, uh, I agree. Uh, we've had some uh, fascinating guests and some fascinating conversations. But, uh, you know, today we've, got some, we've had some great topics and uh, uh, some really good things to listen to. Generally good news in the marijuana industry, uh, Jerry Garcia's birthday, and, of course, the opportunity to listen to music that's 50 years old and uh, was just uh, discovered by happenstance and, and, and good luck that you only find uh, when you hang out with the good old Grateful Dead. Um, but we will be back next week. Rob Hunt will be joining us again. Uh, we've got a number of really good guests lined up in the coming weeks that we'll be talking to. Um, Fish's uh, summer tour uh, is getting ready to kick off any day now. In fact, uh, uh, this coming weekend, I'll be on my way to Indianapolis to see two Fish shows at Deer Creek, uh, which is one of my favorite venues. And I'm very, very excited about uh, that. And 
we'll look forward to uh, having some great stories to tell when I get back. Oh, I'm looking forward to hearing that. I'm very excited for Labor Day weekend, our end of the summer three fish shows here, which I'll be attending. Sure. So, uh, yeah, with that, uh, this is uh, Jim Marty saying over and out till next week. Thank you, Jim. And to all of our listeners, we appreciate you tuning in as always. Uh, we will look forward to speaking with you in the future and hope you will continue to listen to our show and tell all your friends about it. It's a lot of fun if you're a deadhead or you like marijuana or both. Uh, so until then, everyone, we will talk to you next time.